So what is the current situation? Canada legalized May in June of 2016, which is euthanasia and assisted suicide. So right off the bat, I agree. Call it what it is. It's euthanasia and assisted suicide. In the case of the Canadian context, it's almost all euthanasia. There's almost no assisted suicide going on. The difference between the two is euthanasia is done by lethal injection. So it's what the doctor does to the person they the doctor actually kills them it's a and in the criminal code canada legalized euthanasia by creating an exception to homicide in a criminal code assisted suicide is when the doctor would give you the same lethal drugs but you take it yourself there's almost no assisted suicide in canada it's almost all euthanasia since then canada has has uh, nearly passed bill c7 to expand the legislation now remember we're not even five years in even though they have, and they have not done the five-year review that the original legislation mandated to be done starting in June of 2020. It happens to be almost February of 2021. Now, I know we had COVID. Nonetheless, they have no intention of starting the five-year review until they finish with Bill C-7 because their thinking is now after that, we're going to talk about the further expansions, which include people with mental illness, uh, child euthanasia, et cetera, et cetera. The expansion of Canada's euthanasia law, Bill C-7, is supposedly based on the Quebec Truchon court decision, but in fact, it goes much further and beyond Truchon, okay? Uh, and if I pronounce Truchon wrong, I'm sorry. So what does Bill C-7 do? It removes the requirement of law that a person's natural death be reasonably foreseeable in order to qualify for assisted death. Now, first of all, that definition was always bad anyway, uh, because what did it mean that your natural death be reasonably foreseeable? Nothing personal. But many of us, if not all of us, our natural death is reasonably foreseeable. Uh, the term was uh, squishy on purpose in order to allow an expansion of the, uh, of the definition of the law over time anyway. Therefore, people who are not terminally ill uh, can die by euthanasia. Now, as I say, that was already going on, but I mean, this makes it more clear. The Quebec court decision only required this amendment to the law. Bill C-7 permits a doctor or nurse practitioner to lethally inject a person who is incapable of consenting if that person was previously approved for assisted death. So when uh, Ramon and Leone were, were referring to there being a form of, you know, uh, uh, euthanasia or made by, uh, you know, pre-consent, this is what they're referring to. So what that means is if I was already approved for lethal injection, but then let's say I had a massive coronary between that time and the time of actually injecting me, so now I'm incompetent, so I'm incapable of consenting. Uh, the current law required me to be capable of consenting at the time of death. This wipes that out. Uh, I believe this contravenes the Supreme Court of Canada uh, uh, Carter decision, which stated that only competent people could die by made euthanasia. Uh, Bill C-7 waives the 10-day waiting period if a person's natural death is deemed to be reasonably foreseeable. Um, well, right off the bat, the, uh, there's different rates. I just uh, published a big article about the Ontario data, and it shows that in, uh, in the second half of 2020, 31% of all euthanasia deaths, they waived the 10-day waiting period. And as, um, and as Amy was pointing out, about 60% of the time, it's waived now in Quebec. <coughs> but that means that's the person who, can, who requests death by euthanasia on a bad day can die the same day. And that's this important point. Studies prove that the will to live fluctuates. Those are studies that were done in Canada by Dr. Harvey Chachinoff. His studies are conclusive. He started also that whole thing about the will to live um, program and uh, his research should be uh, honored and recognized rather than ignored. Bill C-7 creates a two-track law. A person whose natural death is deemed to be reasonably foreseeable has no waiting period. So if they look at you and they say, it looks like you're dying soon anyway, you get no waiting period, you can die the same day. Well, a person whose natural death is not deemed to be reasonably foreseeable. So let's say somebody who's going through a chronic condition, somebody who has a chronic disability, but who's not dying, uh, they could be then be approved for euthanasia based on a 90 day waiting period. Uh, as was said by um, uh, Ramona and Leone in their presentation, uh, for people who go through, let's say a traumatic injury, often 90 days is the low point for them. And yet this is a, now a 90 day waiting period to kill someone who's not terminally ill. Now there's another problem with two track law. If you have followed anything about Canadian court decisions, this creates an inequality in the law. I believe, and you can say I'm wrong, but I think I'm absolutely right. The reason they did this is that would, this would end up being struck down. This creates an inequality in the law. You have a two track law. That means we're not treated equally. 
as stated early, earlier uh, by me, uh, by, by, not by others actually, I, I say this because usually it's uh, Bill C-7 falsely claims to prevent euthanasia, uh, prevents euthanasia for people with mental illness. Uh, Bill C-7 does not prevent euthanasia for people with mental illness, it doesn't. And the reason is, is the language is very clearly fuzzy, okay? The euthanasia law permits made for people who are physically or psychologically suffering. And it says that, it, that uh, their suffering must be intolerable to the person. So a physician like Leone is not assessing their physical or psychological suffering because it's based on, is that suffering intolerable to the person? And, and then they, it could be relieved, but if the person says that it cannot be relieved in a way that the person considers acceptable. So therefore, this is very subjective. Mental illness is already defined as a form of psychological suffering. Therefore, clearly, whether uh, you know the justice minister intends this or not in Canada, mental illness is not prohibited by Bill C-7, euthanasia for mental illness. Uh, certainly the, the law says it is, but it isn't. And on top of that, by placing the, the uh, wording in the law that, that it is prohibited, what it means is that there, there might be less euthanasia for mental illness, but I'll guarantee you the pro-euthanasia lobby doctors will recognize that this is so fuzzy that in fact they can go ahead and do it and have no fear. So in July 2020, Health Canada released its first annual report. Now let's get this into perspective. This was legalized in June of 2016. Health Canada released its first annual report in July 2020. Hmm, I guess they weren't so so uh, interested in getting us effective data. Anyway, the data was gathered from the reports submitted by the physicians and nurse practitioners who caused the death. So what's uh, different about Canada as compared to, let's say, the state of Oregon, is we allow physicians and nurse practitioners to be involved in the act. I think the reason they did that is to create an ability for more uh, people to be able to legally be involved in the act. So there's not a, I would say a limited number. There's no requirement that a third party or neutral, neutral person submit the euthanasia reports to ensure accuracy, which is no different than Oregon. So in fact, these reports are based on self reporting. Okay, that's where the data is coming from. So if, if there was, a, a, how would you say, a suspicious death, the data is not gonna show up in the reports, okay? The data from, so how do we find out about suspicious deaths? How do we find out about things that would be considered uh, untoward when you consider uh, what the law or what Canadians would consider acceptable? The only way we find that out is if you're a family member or a friend who happens to know what happened in that circumstance. The data from the report indicated that in 2019, there was 5,631 reported May deaths, which they estimated as 2% of all deaths, which was up from 4467 in 2018. And when all the data was considered, there had been 13,946 medically assisted deaths as of December 31st, 2019. Well, now we're almost at the end of January 2021. 20, uh, so obviously when you read my recent articles and I'm talking about there's been now at least 21,000, um, it's very interesting to see that. An article I was just looking at on the, in, the, in my uh, uh, emails today uh, quotes my data from Ontario, which I'm just saying here, but then it got the, the number wrong uh, nationally because it suggested this 13,946. So it was saying that Ontario accounts for almost half the deaths when in fact, of course, 13,946 was based on December 31st, 2019, not December 31st, 2020. Let's get back to it. The Ontario data is what I receive monthly. So in fact, uh, um, the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, we've requested the data from all provinces, but only Ontario has been willing to send us the reports. And so there's been 6,696 reported assisted deaths since legalization. Now here's the data you need to see. 6,694 were euthanasia, clinician administered. Two were assisted suicide, self-administered. So obviously almost all of them, almost all of them. Uh, the number of assisted deaths are continually increasing. In Ontario, there's a 33% increase in 2020. One of the reasons for that was COVID. Uh, there's been quite a few COVID-related deaths by euthanasia. There was 2,378 reported assisted deaths in 2020 alone, which accounts for about 200 a month. Now, if you're going to look at the data further, you'll realize that our rate's actually greater than 200 a month in the second half of 2020. So if you're looking at the data, you realize that our rate is now greater than 200 a month uh, in Ontario. Uh, the first half of 2020, it was less than 200 a month. 
The euthanasia followed by organ donation data is also interesting. So in July of 2019, they, Ontario started uh, uh, putting the organ donation data within its Ontario data. So as of July of 2019, there have been 29 related organ donation uh, uh, assisted deaths. So assisted deaths meaning some of them, there might have been one assisted suicide death. It's basically, it's all euthanasia. So if you look at the data in 2019 of July, it was 3,485 assisted deaths, euthanasia deaths, 29 had related organ donations. And then you see in December, it was 4,318, 36. So you see the rate there. Now what's very interesting in December of 2020, it shows 6,696 uh, euthanasia deaths, 49 were related, had a related organ donations. Now you know the rate actually slowed down. And I think that has a lot to do against with, again with COVID-19 because in, in Ontario, uh, a lot of the, uh, how would you say, uh, healthcare procedures that were not considered essential were stopped because of the, uh, the influx of people with COVID or the fear of being overrun by COVID in the hospitals. And therefore, uh, people who were gonna be scheduled for certain surgeries, those surgeries were all delayed. So that would also affect the issue of organ donation. We were successful in defeating euthanasia bills in Canada. So when people say, oh, is this is dark, dark time, what's going on? We defeated the euthanasia bills in Canada. In 2010, there was the euthanasia bill by Francine Lalonde that was defeated in Canada's parliament by 228 to 59. But then the courts got involved. So we must continue to tell people what this legislation does, how it does it. Uh, just yesterday, I was speaking to a woman who was opposed to euthanasia, but didn't realize it was legal in Canada. And funny enough, this is somebody who uh, supports our cause and who was just contacting me, sent me an email, and I responded to the email, and then this person was uh, shocked. Now, maybe they don't read emails, they delete them all, and that's fine, uh, but nonetheless, they didn't, didn't realize it was legal in Canada, and this was one of our supporters. We must work with everyone who cares about the issue. Uh, there's no, uh, you can't say, oh, uh, this person is, I don't agree with this person philosophically. We must expose the truth by helping to find and distribute stories. This is the very hard difficulty because the people who were, were writing stories about what we need stories about, they're dead people. Now, some of them are still alive because in the case of uh, some people who were pressured, they said no. And they talk about how they were being pressured towards euthanasia. Uh, but those, uh, those stories are also hard to come by because a lot of people are in a situation and unless they have a lot of strength of character, uh, they don't want to talk about it. There's, there's something going on in the Toronto Star right now where some guy is uh, writing daily about his last few days of life as he approaches euthanasia. So he's going to be famous in his death. Uh, people who oppose euthanasia tend not to write about the last few days of life and have an article every day about the last few days of life as they approach natural death. Tends not to happen that way. Assisted suicide is now legal in California, Colorado, Hawaii, Maine, New Jersey, Oregon, Vermont, Washington State, and the District of Columbia. And it's also permitted in Montana based on the Baxter Court decision, which created a defense of consent. Now, I, I based... Uh, typing that in based on alphabetical order. So that's not based on which ones were the first to legalize, which were the last. Assisted suicide bills are currently uh, uh, been in introduced in the US this year in Arizona, Indiana, New Mexico, and New York. And a bill to expand assisted suicide is being debated in Washington state, okay? It's an important bill in Washington state because if they expand assisted suicide in Washington state, then obviously that creates the precedent to affect all other assisted suicide bills. So House, House Bill 141 is sponsored by the same representative who sponsored Bill 2419 last year in Washington State. Now, you may say, why does this matter? The reason it matters is because they're talking about expanding assisted suicide and what do they actually want, right? What, what are they actually pushing for? Uh, HB 2419, which is a Washington State bill last year, uh, was passed. It asks the state to fund a study to be conducted at the University of Washington to determine how to expand state assisted suicide laws, also known in Washington state as the Death with Dignity Act. HB 2419 passed, but the governor vetoed the bill as a measure to save money during the COVID crisis. So it's important to understand that the bill passed last year to study it. This year, they've gone forward with a bill, not to study, but actually to change the law. 2419, I'm only gonna show you a few things. Uh, that's important. It, 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 it wanted to look at the issue of the waiting periods, the 15-day waiting period. It wanted to look at the issue of um, uh, access to compound pharmacies in the state of Washington and other places. And the reason for this 
is uh, they do, as uh, if you heard Dr. Toffler's presentation, uh, the drugs they use for assisted suicide are actually uh, not, how would you say, they're drug cocktails. So therefore, they want, they're using these compounding pharmacies. They're ask, asking the pharmacist to actually create the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the drugs for killing. The restrictions, this is the important thing. They want to look at the issue of the restrictions based on the requirement that medications are self-administered. Now, they use the word medication. I'm talking about lethal drugs. That's the question of euthanasia. They were wanting to study whether or not this, the assisted suicide law should be expanded to euthanasia. Then there's issues of encourage, uh, I mean, insurance coverage, et cetera, et cetera. So this is important. The current uh, bill uh, does a couple of things in, in, in Washington state because this will affect all of the U.S. if it passes. It expands the list of who can provide lethal drugs. So what they did is they looked at Canada, for instance, and the previous law, the current law in Washington state only requires physicians, only allows physicians. So they've changed it to the thing called qualified medical provider. So they're saying that these lethal drug cocktails could be prescribed not only by a licensed physician, but also a licensed physician assistant, an osteopathic physician, advanced registered nurse practitioner. So what they're doing is they're expanding who is qualified to approve and prescribe lethal drugs. Now there's a couple of reasons for doing this. One is of course, if you have more people who are qualified to approve and prescribe lethal drugs, obviously it's easier to get assisted suicide. So there'll be more assisted suicide. Uh, they're, what they're saying here is there's too many doctors like Dr. Toffler who refuse to kill. So what we'll do is we'll expand the list of who's capable of killing. They're also saying they're gonna expand the list of who's able to counsel. Now counseling is a minor issue because if you look at the data, almost never do they do counseling. The law says in Washington state that if someone is experiencing uh, you know, issues related to their ability to consent, such as deeply depressed, uh, they might be uh, going through dementia, et cetera, there's a question of their ability to consent. They could be, as I say, going through mental illness issues, whatever. They would then be sent to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, which is also obviously in the legislation, but they wanna expand that to include independent clinical social workers, advanced social workers, mental health counselors, and psychiatric advanced registered nurse practitioners. Now, by expanding this list, obviously it's easier for Compassion and Choices, which is the group in the, in the US, to have people do this counseling. This counseling is actually, as I say, a minor issue because almost never is somebody sent for counseling in Washington State or Oregon or any of these states in the US. Now I'm gonna say something else here, which, which might be considered controversial, but it shouldn't. If you make it easier to approve and prescribe lethal drugs or you lessen the qualifications of who can do it, it's easier to set up an assisted suicide clinic. First of all, physicians cost more money than physician assistants. And on top of it, if, if, if all you need is, a, you know, an advanced social worker to do counseling or a mental health counselor, these are lower requirements. It's easier to set up your assisted suicide clinic, ability to do a lot more killing. The bill uh, currently in Washington state that's being debated would eliminate the 15 day waiting period and replace it with a 72 hour waiting period. But then it says that 72 hour waiting period can be waived. So it's the same as what happened in Oregon. Last year, uh, the, uh, the Oregon assisted suicide law was changed that the 15 day waiting period can be waived and um, to a 72 hour waiting period. And that, I mean, and that could be waived if someone's considered to be dying. So instead of allowing someone to die a natural death, we better kill them quickly. Once again, studies prove the will to live fluctuates. And this is a very important time issue because I believe that by removing the waiting period, they're actually countering their big you know, uh, sales pitch of choice at the end of life because in fact, uh, removing the waiting period removes choice at the end of life. Uh, it leads to a same day death. And also, as I say, the will to live fluctuates. HB 1141 uh, allows lethal assisted suicide drugs to be delivered to the person. So it means that your uh, US Postal Service would be dropping off a package at your door, or maybe a pure later be dropping off the package at the door, or one of those brown trucks, and it has the lethal drugs in it. Now let's think about this. Uh, during COVID times, a lot of people are not shopping, they're shopping online and they're receiving packages which come to their door and it could be whatever they've ordered, uh, sometimes even food that they've ordered. And there's been a big complaints about packages being stolen. 
think about this. Uh, now you're gonna have lethal drugs showing up and being dropped off at someone's door like this. HB 1141 if passed will not only affect Washington state, but it would open the door to expanding assisted suicide throughout the US because of course it would become the precedent model. As this existing approval and reporting systems already deny effective oversight of the law. It's the same as in Canada. There is no effective oversight of the law. The law already allows the same physician to approve assisted suicide and in Canada's case, euthanasia, then prescribe in the case of Canada, do the lethal injection. And then it's the same person who's required to report the death. There's no oversight of the law. This is a self-reporting system of, uh, you know, obviously this, does, this protects the physician. It does not protect people. And in fact, uh, when, uh, when they're sending in a report, how can you be sure that the report is accurate? If there was something that was a gray area that occurred, are they gonna self-report abuse of the law or questionable issues? And the answer, of course, is no, they're not. They don't know they're not. I, as I say to people, um, as, a, as a person from Ontario, I say when I'm driving down the 401, which is our, our sort of super highway that goes to Toronto, when I'm driving down the 401 and I'm speeding at a ridiculous speed, do I call the Ontario police to pick me up? The answer is no. The lethal drug cocktails also, this is what uh, Dr. Toffler spoke about, so I can go through it quickly, very fast. Uh, lethal drug cocktails that were developed to lower the cost have known side effects. Uh, the Seattle Times reported in March 2017, the first second all alternative turned out to be too harsh, burning patients' mouths and throats, causing some to scream in pain. In fact, 67 people died by having their mouths and throats burned as they were dying. 67. They didn't just notice that this wasn't working well, they just kept doing it. The second drug mix, mix that they're uh, using has led to these very long drawn out deaths and uh, there was one case in 2018 of 31 hours. An article published in the Atlantic, January 2019 stated an advocacy organization called End of Life Washington briefly advised prescribing a drug mixture with the sedative chloral hydrate, which is what I mentioned. And this is what Robert Wood, the uh, medical director of the organization said. He said, we're, we know this is going to put you to sleep and we're pretty sure it's gonna kill you. But it worked out to have a tragic catch. In a few cases, the chlor chloral hydrate burned people's throats, causing severe pain. Well, they knew that and they kept on going. The Medical Express reported in September 8, 2020, a little known secret not publicized by advocates of aid in dying was that while most deaths were speedy, others were very slow. Some patients lingered for six or nine hours, a few more than three days. Assisted suicide is not what it appears to be. There was uh, one that was down as 47 hours. I believe that was in Oregon though. Many people support assisted suicide and euthanasia based on the fear of dying a bad death. The fear of by dying a bad death. Euthanasia and assisted suicide can cause a bad death. Now euthanasia is less likely to cause a bad death. And I know this and I'll be honest because I understand how it works and Dr. Toffler explained it too, that in fact, how the Canadian guidelines tend to work is that they give the person the injection. Now remember the physician's there because they're the one injecting, unless it's a nurse doing it nonetheless. Uh, and if you didn't die within a certain period of time, they then give you another dose, another shot. So obviously when you get the second dose because you didn't die quickly, um, usually that amount of drug means that you're dead. Like, I mean, you're, you know, it's, a, it's enough to kill pretty much anything. The assisted suicide promoters and practitioners developed these lethal drug cocktails in the US by doing human trials rather than animal trials. The team appeared concerned with the lethal efficacy and the cost of, lethal, of the lethal cocktails as opposed to the possible negative consequence with the use of these drugs. Then I asked the question, were these human trials done with full consent of the participants? Now, why do I ask that question? Well, they obviously had consent to be involved with assisted suicide because these people were approved for assisted suicide and they had gone through that process. But did they agree to be part of a human trial that they would receive lethal drugs that were being experimented upon them? I would say they did not give full consent to that especially if they had known what would be the possible consequences. So I'm gonna look at some Washington State data just to give you some information. If you're an American, this helps you at least looking at the data. You'll notice this data is much lower than Ontario. Now there's fewer people who live in Washington State than live in Ontario, but on top of it, we have euthanasia. In the US, it's assisted suicide. 
So the Washington State report in 2018 indicated that there had been a 25% increase in 2018. So the numbers are going up. There was 203 reported assisted deaths, up from 164 in 2017. 267 lethal prescriptions dispensed up from 2012 and 2017. 29 no natural deaths and 16 uh, where the death status was still pending, meaning they might have received the drugs in November or December. So therefore they weren't dead yet in 2018. They died in 2019 or possibly 2020 or not at all. They might've died a natural death, but there was 19 unknown deaths. So if you look at the Oregon data, it's got the same situation. It shows this number unknown deaths. Now we have to understand what that means. Unknown deaths refers to the fact that the Washington state government knows they died, they just don't know how they died. They have no report saying they died by assisted suicide. They don't know if they died a natural death. They have no idea. Now let's think this through. You're giving people lethal drugs, a lethal drug cocktail. It can be pretty caustic as uh, Dr. Toffler has already explained. Uh, yet you've got 19 un known deaths. Does that seem like a system of oversight? We're talking about life and death. You know, we're not talking about giving somebody uh, uh, pain killing drugs, which could be also very, uh, you know, concerning, but I, I mean, we're talking about life and death and intentional. The report also stated in Washington State that there was eight people reportedly who experienced complications in 2018, which is up from four in 2017. But it also showed that 62 people died more than 90 minutes after taking the lethal drugs and in 2018, the time of death ranged from seven minutes to 30 hours. Seven minutes, that's very interesting. Hmm, I don't wonder how that happened. According to the 2019 Oregon data, I'll go through this very quickly, but I wanna show you something. In, 28, in 2019, there was 58 unknown status deaths, 58. There was 43 in 2018. That's 101 over two years in Oregon. They might all be assisted suicide deaths that were not reported. We don't know. That's the point, we simply don't know. My point comes back that in fact, what are they saying here? This is oversight over a law that is directly involved with killing people. Um, and this again, I'm showing you the time of death range from one minute in Oregon. How did someone die in one minute? If Dr. Toffler were on, he'd probably say that's not possible. I'd probably agree with him, dying in one minute. How did that happen? Did someone put a pillow on their head? I'm sorry to say it, but it seems to me it might be. Anyway, to 47 hours. Uh, one patient was referred for a psychological or psychiatric evaluation. Only one person out of the, in 2019, out of the 188 deaths. And there was one physician referred to the Oregon Medical Board in uh, 2018 for failure to, to comply with the law. I still ask the question about 101 unknown deaths in Oregon in two years. Uh, Oregon Governor Kate Brown in 20, July, 29 signed, uh, July 2019 signed the bill, which eliminated the 15-day waiting period. In the final paragraph of the 2019 Assisted Suicide Report in Hawaii, the Department of Health re recommended the following changes to the law. Waive the waiting periods. Oregon had already done that. Washington State's talking about doing that. And give access to healthcare providers uh, who are also registered nurses and others because they wanted to increase who can be involved with assisted suicide. Because obviously they're saying in Hawaii, there's too few doctors willing to kill. We need others involved. Why am I showing that? This is a trend. New Mexico assisted suicide bill HB 47 is being debated right now. HB 47 does what? It expands who can approve assisted suicide. Now remember, they haven't legalized assisted suicide in New Mexico. So what it means is that instead of starting with physicians in New Mexico, they're talking about starting right off the bat with a wider group of people who can approve. It says physicians, licensed physician assistants. Obviously the New Mexico bill is based on the, the uh, um, Washington State Assisted Suicide Expansion Bill. HB 47 also expands who can counsel. But what HB 47 does, which is very interesting in New Mexico, why am I showing you this? It's the it's the whole pressure in the US right now to expand these laws. It waives the requirement that a person be confirmed by a second healthcare provider if the requester is enrolled in hospice. So what the um, New Mexico bill, which hasn't passed, it's being debated right now, is saying you don't need two physicians or two nurse practitioners to approve it. If the person is enrolled in hospice, one approval will be enough. Um, I think Leone should be concerned about that because uh, 
her uh, her fellow hospice physicians in uh, in New Mexico uh, will be pressured now because if they have a patient who's asking for assisted suicide, there's no need for a second healthcare provider to approve this, all based on hospice alone. HP 47 does not require a 15-day waiting period. It has a 48-hour waiting period, but of course that can be waived. Once again, same thing. Clearly the assisted suicide lobby and the euthanasia lobby has an agenda to expand these laws, not only in the US, but as you see what's happening in Canada, the expansion. There are right now assisted suicide bills, as I say, in Arizona and Indiana, which are similar to the traditional Oregon style assisted suicide bills. So in both Arizona and Indiana, they've decided to introduce bills to legalize assisted suicide that are more uh, traditional oriented, meaning they have the 15 day waiting period, they only require physicians to do it, et cetera. And these are, are written, in my opinion, in a way of that they hope to pass these bills because they plan to expand the law in the future as they're looking at in Washington state. New York has an assisted suicide study bill. Now I know that in 1994, the New York uh, uh, legislature uh, published a report on assisted suicide, which was fabulous. But uh, in uh, 2021, you only really need a study bill on assisted suicide if you intend to legalize it. So that's what's going on in New York. They have a study bill. Fighting assisted suicide and euthanasia. Well, I think you've heard a lot of this from Wesley before, but you can hear it from me now. We need to call it what it is. Using such terms as aid in dying or physician assisted death or doctor prescribed death doesn't help us. These are things that make, make it look less onerous than it actually is. Use the term assisted suicide, euthanasia, lethal drugs, killing. They hate when we call it killing, but what is it? If it's not killing, what is it, okay? What actually is it? We oppose assisting a suicide because these laws allow one person to be directly involved with causing the death of another person. That's why we believe it's wrong to kill someone. It's not safe to kill someone. Creating exceptions to homicide and manslaughter are bad ideas. Canada legalized euthanasia. So if you look at the criminal code, you look at Bill C-14, and then you look at Bill C-7, how it's going to amend C-14, you realize that they did one honest thing, only one honest thing. And the honest thing is they amended the criminal code under the Homicide Act. So they're admitting it's homicide. It's murder. They're admitting it. Okay. Uh, the note that the term aid in dying is used for both euthanasia and assisted suicide. So you're going to notice in the U.S., if you're a U.S. follower right now, you're going to notice that they're using the term uh, aid in dying a lot now. And the reason they're using that term is because they intend to expand to euthanasia. We need to talk about what it is. The other side claims these are deaths with dignity. They, pres they, they describe them as peaceful, quick, painless. Who doesn't want a peaceful, quick, painless death? Well, these are not all peaceful, quick, or painless deaths. These are about killing people, yes, but it's all a lie. And uh, I could tell you a little bit more, but uh, we'll, we'll go on. Um, I will tell you a little bit more. I went a few years ago to um, uh, a Dying with Dignity conference. It was actually the International uh, Right to Die Society conference. And I was sitting beside a woman who was from New Zealand who had been involved with um, uh, killing her mother. And so if people know who I'm talking about now, and that woman explained that in the end, uh, she actually, what she had done is she had saved up the morphine enough to kill her mother, but then it didn't kill her mother. So even though that's what she was charged with, that she gave her mother an intentional lethal dose of morphine, but in fact what had happened is it didn't kill her mother, she ended up using a pillow. And we're thinking about this and we're thinking, who would then use a pillow on their mother? Isn't that a terrible idea? This is what we were talking about with these people. This is what, they, this is what their orientation was. We need to talk about what it is. For the palliative care docs, I'm sorry, we should not be focusing on palliative care. Not because palliative care is not a good thing. It is a good thing. It is good to care for people's pain and symptom management. The problem is, is when we're focusing on palliative care, palliative care is not an answer to euthanasia and assisted suicide. It's certainly an antidote to it, providing proper care is. But I mean, people who are uh, seeking euthanasia and assisted suicide are not necessarily opposed to palliative care. But the second thing is, when we talk about uh, palliative care, it focuses on pain and symptom management. And these people are actually in fear of pain. People are asking for euthanasia and assisted suicide for existential reasons, but also because they're in fear of possible future pain. 
you know, when you look at the data out of Oregon, you look at the studies that were done by Linda Ganzini, et cetera, and a few others, you realize people are not asking for euthanasia or assisted suicide based on actual pain. It's because of fear of future, future pain. But when we're talking about palliative care, you'd say, oh no, we're talking about caring for these distressing symptoms that you don't need to suffer, but in fact, the person's hearing and they want, they're saying, but I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer. And they're thinking, I'll support assisted suicide or euthanasia just in case I am suffering. We need to focus on what assisted suicide is, not why it's unnecessary, okay? Talk about the lethal drug experiments. Now in the US especially, death by lethal drugs may not be dignified, quick or peaceful. Uh, and this is in the US more so, but this is uh, quite a few of our listeners right now are from the US. Uh, these experiments were inappropriate and very likely unethical and they caused people to suffer. The Nuremberg Code of Ethics clearly prohibits human experimentation without proper consent. It actually, the Nuremberg Code of Ethics also clearly prohibits um, the medical experimentation that causes death. So that would fit here too. Uh, clearly they had consent to prescribe the lethal drugs, but did they have consent for human experimentation? Work with people from all political points of view. There's not one silver bullet to prevent the passage of a euthanasia or assisted suicide bill. There's not one silver bullet. People with disabilities have personal experience and that needs to be heard by politicians. You know, the sad thing is, is that a lot of the politicians are just growing tired and they're closing their ears and the reason is, is that they're, uh, the new sort of mandate in 2020, 2021 is different than maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago. There's so much now party discipline now. If you look at the Canadian experience, and I don't think it's that different from the U.S. experience, but it could be a little different. And I, I know in the U.S. you have, you know, 50 states. So obviously things vary state by state with political, uh, how things are politically. But in Canada, there's so much pressure on politicians from certain parties to vote in favor of euthanasia that almost all of them will just do it blindly. They don't want to hear from us. And if you give them good arguments against it, very few of them have changed their mind. It's very sad. We must encourage people to work together, but we shouldn't discourage people from working on their own. Uh, you'll never see me discouraging someone from working on their own, but nonetheless, yes, it's good to work together. It's good to share experience. It's good to share knowledge. It's good to work together also because then we can help identify political points of view and help work on those politicians together. Nonetheless, we all have different perspectives and that's good. Don't hesitate to talk about changes in the Canadian law. If you're in the US, we're the prime example, I'm sad to say, of why this should never be legalized. Uh, if Even if you're in Europe, talking about the Netherlands and Belgium, people say, oh, that's been there for a long time. Yes, it's only been in Canada legal since 2016, sadly, we have uh, a, a horrific history with this and I feel terrible about what's happened. All I can tell you is it's not my fault. Canada legalized euthanasia and assisted suicide in June of 2016 and in four years, uh, in a little over four years, we have gone from terrible to almost completely insane. Like the Netherlands and Belgium, Canada is talking about expanding euthanasia for children, for competent people, uh, who made advanced requests for people with Alzheimer's and dementia, for people with, with mental illness, and more. In November 2020, Canada's Justice Minister told the Senate Committee that he wanted to expand euthanasia to include people with mental illness, but he said this bill didn't include it because he didn't have time to do that. Well, give me a break. You know, what he's saying is, is that it was so controversial that we'll do that next. Uh, what he's not willing to hear is maybe he should be looking at what's actually happening in Canada and, and having a proper review first before he considers anything. Uh, these bills are trampling on conscience rights in Canada. Physicians clearly are, are facing this issue of conscience rights. Um, and I know that uh, one of the presenters was talking about how uh, we're gonna have a brain drain out of Canada. Some great physician's gonna leave Canada or leave Ontario because they're being pressured to be involved in euthanasia. In fact, that's already going on. Sadly, I know of several physicians who were excellent physicians who've left Canada, left Ontario, and um, and it's very terrible that this has happened. The BC government is defunding the Delta Hospice Society. So as of February 24, 2021, that will be the end of the funding for the Delta Hospice Society because they refuse to kill their patients. That's even happening even though the Palliative Care Physicians Association and the Canadian Palliative Care Association have clearly said a uh, made and palliative care are different, and yet still the BC government is going forward with that. In Ontario, doctors must provide an effective referral for euthanasia, which means referral for the purpose of the act. 
This requires conscientious objectors to be directly involved in the act. And there's some information about me. One of our supporters, uh, what he did is he wrote a letter to his physician, and he's a, a person who was born with a disability. So he's, uh, he's been a, a lifelong person who has lived the disability experience. And he wrote a letter to his physician explaining why he opposed euthanasia. And he made it very clear that whatever happens in his medical condition, I do not want euthanasia. I might be going through a terrible experience. I might even say something that I would never otherwise say, but I don't want euthanasia. And so his, his doctor actually called him up and said, uh, I'll make sure that's, that's in your medical record. I will make sure that that is in every way put into your medical record. Because he said, you know, it could be that you end up in emergency someday. I'm not there. Uh, he said, as a physician, I'm not going to do that to you. I don't believe in euthanasia, he said. Plus, on top of it, he said, I wouldn't do that to you. But you might end up in, in the hospital and have a totally different physician. There has to be something in your medical record that gives them an indication that you think this is wrong. And so that's what he did. We also have the power of attorney document that we sell. And we changed it at the time of the, uh, of the legalization of euthanasia, actually just beforehand. We changed it to specifically refer to euthanasia and assisted suicide. I do not want euthanasia. I do not want assisted suicide. It's very clear. It's legally written, very clear. And even if I should ask for it, it says, it says treat that as a need for pain and symptom management. Uh, right now in Canada, we have Bill C-7, which is at the, in the Senate. What's gonna happen in the Senate? I can't predict what's gonna happen in the Senate. What I do say is anything that holds this Bill C-7 up is a good thing. Anything that slows it down is a good thing. Um, and that's all I have to say right now because the way things are politically in Canada right now, without having an election uh, beforehand, uh, things are politically not so good. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this is not uh, the end of the world. We shouldn't see it as the end of the world. We see this as the challenge for tomorrow. And uh, that's the way we have to look at things. And also on our YouTube page, we have a couple of amazing presentations. I've got one by Dr. Herx and one by Dr. Quello talking about conscience rights and Bill C-7 and everything. I've got another one by Dr. Toffler. If you want to hear the, the definitive talk on what's going on in the U.S. with these lethal drug experiments, we did a... Uh, we did a, a show with Dr. Toffler a couple months ago. Thank you to all of our speakers and everyone who joined us. And uh, if you're not a member of the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition, it's only $25. Please do so. It's not going to bankrupt you, but it helps us know who we're working with and to work together. Thank you.